and things. Um, kind of still on this find your moment thing. I thought of another one this week. Uh, today's sermon is find your moment to help others find their moment. Um, I mean, let me just start with this question. Have you ever missed an opportunity and afterwards you kind of felt sick over it? Like, you kind of that, oh man, I wish I... I'm not talking about living with regrets. I try not to live with a lot of regrets. But you've ever had just that time where, like, man, you saw an opportunity and you didn't take it afterwards. You're like, man, I really should have taken that opportunity. That ever happened to anyone besides me? There was a, uh, there was a Memphis resident named Kimmons Wilson. And uh, in 1951, he traveled to D.C. with his wife and his five children. And as many of us do when we travel for extended periods of time and don't have family where we're going, he stayed in motels along the way. And uh, he wasn't satisfied at all with the experience that he had in staying in these motels uh, with his family. So not just to complain about the experience he had, he, had, he decided to actually do something about it. Kimmons Wilson decided to start his own hotel um, in Memphis. And to do so, he sought investors uh, from all over, but especially from fellow Memphians. Like, you know, you kind of go around and you find business partners and people you know and neighbors and friends and family. And you ask everyone you can. You, you pitch them your ID. You tell them why, why the world needs it. And you say, hey, will you invest this much money for this many shares? Of the business of this percentage ownership and and you know you'll be in on the ground floor of this awesome opportunity right and, and sometimes you kind of like you got the crazy uncle that always has those ideas or the multi-level marketer that's always hitting you up on facebook right and you kind of say no to those but 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 kimmins was serious about this he he was going to make this dream happen he saw uh, an opportunity in the marketplace and he wasn't going to let the opportunity pass him by now one of those Memphians that he went to seek an investment from was named Milton Wiggins. He was a, a young family man with an entrepreneurial spirit himself. And uh, Kimmons Wilson felt that Milton just made sense as an investor. It was a perfect opportunity for him to get in on the ground floor while he was young and to be a part of something that was big, to sustain his family for a really long time. Now, for whatever reason, and it's not completely clear, maybe it's just a little bit of lack of capital, or maybe Milton just didn't like Wilson's idea, but Milton Wiggins never did decide to invest in the hotel chain, even though he was asked by Kimmons himself. In 1952, Kimmons Wilson opened his first hotel in Memphis, Tennessee. By 1958, he had 50 locations across the country. 100 locations by 1959, 500 locations by 1964, and 1,000 locations by 1968. This took off. The idea was a gold mine. Now, the hotel chain is part of the Intercontinental Hotel Group with 5,700 hotels worldwide under different names of different sorts. And uh, in 2003, the stock was trading at $11 a share. Now it's trading at $63 a share, and it's split and multiplied over several times. The hotel chain is the Holiday Inn, and the man who didn't invest, Milton Wiggins, is the grandfather of my wife, the great-grandfather of my children. Now, I'm not sure if Paul, as the whole family calls him, uh, uh, calls Milton, ever regretted not investing, but I can tell you one thing, we all really regret that he never <laughs> invested in Holiday Inn, because... It'd be worth a lot. Now, I don't know if Chris, Christy would have been on a different socioeconomic status than me by the time we met. I never met Milton. He passed away before I met Christy. But, uh, but we all regret that he let that opportunity walk away. And I feel like sometimes we're going to look at this passage of Scripture today. Um, we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, it'll be on the, on the screen. But we're going to look at the Scripture that talks about miss opportunity and how it can make your heart sick. Uh, in fact, I, I kind of heard a little bit of this, to be honest with you, when I was in Tennessee a couple weeks ago, David Green, pastor of one of our, our partner churches, of our new partner church, preached on this, and it really has just been bouncing around in my head. I, I really feel like it's, it's a, a story and a message that we all need to hear here at Watershed as well. In Jeremiah 8, we find the prophet Jeremiah 
lamenting over a lot of things, but among them are these missed opportunities. Look at Jeremiah chapter 8, starting verse 18. It says this, My joy has flown away. Grief has settled on me. My heart is sick. Okay? You ever notice how sad people are in the Old Testament? Like, have you ever just, if you go through it, there's a lot of people that are really, really struggling with grief and depression and sadness. And uh, I kind of feel like that's where we are right now in society. Like, we're just kind of perpetually dealing with that. Like, it's, maybe it's been ignored for a long time. It's always been there, but, you know, families sweep it under the rug or tell you to keep a stuff up, stiff upper lip or rub some dirt on the wound or whatever and go on with your life. But... And maybe we're just aware of it now that it needs to be addressed. But man, the Old Testament, how they weren't afraid to say that they were battling with these things. Anyways, that's for free. <laughs> Verse 19. Listen, the cry of my dear people from a faraway land. Is the Lord no longer in Zion, her king not within her? Why have they angered me with their carved images, with their worthless foreign idols? Harvest has passed, summer has ended. But we have not been saved. I am broken by the brokenness of my dear people. I mourn. Horror has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? So why has the healing of my dear people not come about? There's a few things I want us to, to look at here. Some, some kind of cues we can take from Jeremiah. Kind of explain a little bit of what he's looking at. He asks several rhetorical questions during this passage of Scripture, all of which the answer is yes. Like, is the Lord no longer in Zion, her king not within her? The answer is yes, absolutely. God is still on the throne. God is still present with us everywhere at every moment. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why is the healing of my dear people not come about? It, those, those two questions, is there no balm, is there no physician? The answer is yes. There is something that can help you. There is someone who wants to heal you. The answer is yes. So we see all these, all these rhetorical questions, but nonetheless, Jeremiah is heart sick. And the first thing I want to point out for us is we need to learn to be heart sick. It's okay at times to feel sickness in our heart, to feel grief. It's okay for our joy to be gone. Like Those are okay seasons. It's not wrong or sinful for you to feel that way sometimes. Jeremiah is actually seeing his friends, his family, his nation, his, physical, his fellow Israelites wander from God, and it made his heart sick. His heart was broken for him. They had wandered from God both physically because they had been taken into captivity. So they were away from the promised land. They had moved away from what God had for them, from the best that God could plan for them. They had gone away from that, and they had... They had moved away. They were wandering from God spiritually because their hearts were far from them. In fact, part of the reason they were in captivity is because they had left and walked away from God. He was heart sick because they had been carried far from home. You know, I think sometimes many of us in this room, spiritually, we've been carried far from home. You know, you can leave home while you're still sitting on the couch. Most of us have been there. Like when you've been in the room, but you're not in the room, your mind is totally somewhere else. And I feel like sometimes that's the way we can get to be with God. It's like, yeah, I'm going through these motions. I know the right thing to do, but right now my heart is just far, far from God. It's wandering, even though I'm right here where I am. You know, a lot of us have friends and family too who have been carried far, far away from home. Maybe. They believe in God, maybe they never believe in God, but you just know that their heart is far from the things of God. You know, we walk away from God and, or try to ignore Him, and our hearts start to drift far, far away. Oftentimes we're carried away by our own doing, by our own pattern of sin and justification. It's just a revolving door. We sin and then we justify because we feel guilty. We sin and then we justify because we feel guilty. And and before long, we stop justifying altogether because our hearts become hardened. Like what used to be sin and cause guilt no longer feels like sin anymore. No longer brings guilt or shame. Not the bad kind that people make you feel because of bullies, but the good kind that God tries to tell you about because He doesn't want you wandering far from home. 
And so we can be heartsick because maybe we wandered or maybe we see friends and family who are near to us and we see that they're wandered, that they're far from God and they have this calloused heart, not, not judging them like we're better than them, but you just see it. It's a calloused heart. They don't care about the things that they do. They don't care what their life stands for. They don't care what their life amounts for. And it's okay to be heart sick when we see the people close to us, the people that we care about, when we see our city and our nation far, far from God. So like Jeremiah, we need to learn to be heart sick. The second thing is to be devoted. Be devoted. Look at verse 19. It says, listen, the cry of my dear people from a faraway land. Is the Lord no longer in Zion, her king not within her? Why have they angered me with their carved images, with their worthless foreign idols? Like I said, it, this starts with that rhetorical question. Is God still not here? Is he not present? The answer is always yes. The answer, if you ever wonder, God, where are you? Where is God? Is he not here? The answer is always yes. The answer is God is always right where he's been. He does not move. There's a, a big fancy theological term for that. It's immutable. God is unchanging. He's unmovable. There's no shadow of turning in God whatsoever. And it's asking, it's like, man, is God still not the God of Jerusalem? Is he still not the God of the city of David? Is he still not the God of Israel who gave them a promise? Why, if he's still God, why are they all over the place? And here's the problem. Israel looked at God as just a choice in the buffet line. The second part of this verse says, Why have they angered me with their carved images, with their worthless foreign idols? In other words, what happened is God called Israel out of slavery. He took them into this promised land. And then they saw other nations. And they saw the way other nations did things. And they said, Why can't we be like them? Why do they get to have a king? Why do they get to have this? Why do they get to have that? We want to be just like them. Why do they get to worship that God that way? Because that looks like more fun than the way we worship our God. Why can't we do that? Why can't we just make up these carved images? Why can't I see my God? They can see the God that they worship. Why can't I see the God that I worship? And so they looked at that, and they are carried away. They said, that looks better to me. And so they started just following the customs and the gods and the idols and the images that other people were following all around them. Israel looked at God as just a choice on a buffet line. It's like you walk through the buffet, yeah, I'll have some of this, some of that, some of this. You get a little bit of everything. And that's what God became. He's like, oh, we'll have a, a little bit of this religion. That sounds good to me. We'll have a little bit of this worldly philosophy. That sounds good to me. I like this part of God. I'll take that. I don't like that part of God. I'll just leave that to the side. And so they kind of created this kind of mishmash. They thought they could have a little of this God and a little of that God. And then they are moved for the one true God. They would have a little of Him too. And we tend, we too tend to have our devotion divided Divided between this world and the God who created it. It's divided between what we should do and what we actually do. God is not content to just be a side item in a buffet line. He wants to be the main course. There are no other choices. God wants us to be devoted. And we see here that Israel was no longer devoted to God. And God's calling us. He's saying, He's asking, He's saying, Are you really devoted to me? Are there people that you see who aren't devoted to me who need to hear about who I am, that I'm the one true God, that I sent my son Jesus Christ to die for this sin? Will you be devoted to me so that others will see you and become devoted to me? So be heart sick, be devoted, and be vigilant. Verse 20 says, Harvest has passed, summer has ended, but we have not been saved. That's a pretty interesting thing. Like, there's kind of two harvest times. I always think about this, like, I, I think about Lancaster sweet corn because I love corn on the cob. It's delicious, especially if you put it on a smoker or something like that, a little grill, a little butter, a little salt. 
And uh, so I always think about that, but there's two hot times when they harvest corn, right? They have July corn and they have August corn. Is anyone aware of this? Or if you have corn that you're raising for feed, you'll even harvest that a little later because you just leave it there to dry out in the sun because it has to get to, uh, below a certain moisture content where they can use it for feed for cattle and horses and whatever else and they're making it for ethanol. But anyways, there's these multiple harvest times for corn and that's kind of what's happening here. Like typically we know that the fall is a harvest, right? But there's a summer harvest too. And it's not that they did the right thing and things didn't work out. It's not like they tried to plant their corn and they fertilized the field, they pulled the weeds and they did everything they did and the corn didn't grow. That's not what happened at all. It's that they didn't even recognize what the right thing was. It's that they didn't even recognize that there was a harvest. You would think that if the harvest was in, everything would be okay, right? That's, I mean, that's the whole deal with Thanksgiving in America. It's right? there is finally there was this harvest, like pilgrims thought they were going to die. Native Americans came and helped them. They showed them how to grow corn. They showed them how to grow all these different crops. They showed them how to harvest some turkey and I don't even know if they had turkey the first thing. I don't think they did, but it's delicious now. But it doesn't matter. But they showed them all these things, and so they had this big celebration because a harvest had come in, and they had been saved from starvation during the long winter. And so you think if there's a harvest, then everything will be okay. But here in this verse, it says the harvest has passed, summer has ended, but we have not been saved. You know, I think we play games like this in our life. In the back of our heads, deep somewhere in our hearts, we know that we are called to obey Jesus Christ. We know that we are called to live in a godly way. I believe that there's a common grace that even convicts people that don't have a relationship with God to know right and wrong. Like most of us innately know that it's wrong to harm, physically harm another person. And I know people do it all the time. Excuse me, but we know that it's wrong. We know innately that it's wrong to lie. We know it's wrong to lie because we don't like being lied to. We don't say, oh man, that was good, you got me. No, we're like, dude, you're a liar. I don't trust you anymore. And we know because we don't like it being done to us, we know there's this underlying moral law that's written on our hearts. And deep somewhere we know what God expects. We know that our friends... And family who have not confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are missing out on the love and salvation that God has for them. Our tendency to have wandering hearts, our, our divided loyalties only create missed opportunities. And, and that's what happened. There was a harvest to be taken in, and they missed the opportunity to harvest. All the food just sat out there in the field to rot. They weren't saved. Nothing happened. Their life hasn't changed whatsoever. We have missed opportunities with God. For those who have not taken that step to put their faith in Jesus Christ, it's a missed opportunity of salvation. For those of us who have taken that step to make Jesus Lord of our lives, we miss opportunities to do what Jesus taught us to do. Not the least of which is to tell our friends and family that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for their sins so that they would not have to if they would only confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised them from the dead. How many times have we missed those opportunities in our life? Maybe it's socially awkward. Maybe we're embarrassed. Maybe we don't want to make someone feel bad. You know, you're not supposed to talk about religion or politics anymore. Maybe the, who knows why. But the opportunity goes. The summer harvest has passed. Still we are not saved. Still there are people in Philadelphia who are not saved. We must be vigilant to be obedient to Jesus to tell others about Him. Jesus wasn't joking when He said, make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Today is the opportunity. Today is the harvest. To find my last point is to be healed. And Jackson, you, you can come on up and start to play. Look at verse 22. Verse 22 says this. 
Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? So why has the healing of my dear people not come about? Gilead, you, you got to know a little about, about Gilead. Gilead was a place known for its medicinal remedies. It was a place known for its doctors. <coughs> Excuse me, it's kind of like CHOP in Philadelphia. You know, it's known to be this great children's hospital. It's known to be this great research hospital. In fact, there's cancer um, treatments that they're working on now on CHOP that are groundbreaking in all the world, and it's, it's known for that. That's what, that's what Gilead was like. People would travel there to receive healing. And so this is these rhetorical questions again. It, it reminds us, though, that it's not too late. Like, the answer is yes, of course, there's, you can go to Gilead and, and get the prescription that you need for your skin condition. Of course, there's doctors there who are working. And what it's saying is that it's not too late. Even though there are missed opportunities, right now is always the best time turn to Jesus. Right now is always the best time to actually do what Jesus teaches us to do. Right now is always the best time to tell someone else that Jesus loved them and died for them. And right now is always the best time to believe that it's actually true. And some of you be like, man, Eric, I'm doing that. Like, I'm, I'm doing it. And I still don't see anything happen. And he asked that question, why has the healing of my dear people not come about? Sometimes that's a hard question to answer. Like why? Why, why haven't we seen anything happen yet? I can't answer that. I really can't. I don't have the answer to that. Um, it seems contrite what we've been talking about a lot this year because it's our, our focus for 2019. But uh, I believe that prayer is part of that answer. I believe that's remaining committed to prayer, being obedient, and not being so much concerned with the results. There's an ointment for the wounded soul. We, we have the ointment. There's a physician to restore people's health, to restore them spiritually. We know the physician. There's a time while the sun is up today to reclaim Miss opportunities. There's a God of second chances and third chances and 400th chances who's offering you and me another chance today. So my question for us is what will we do with it? Let's pray. God, you're amazing. You're awesome. We love you. Lord, I just uh, God, I pray that you give us a heart for the beloved in our city who don't know you, who don't know your son Jesus Christ and salvation for him. Lord, I pray that you give us a heart to be obedient and follow Jesus Christ. God, I pray that we don't become weary, God, because we do. We know we have the healing ointment, God. We know the physician. And God, we have power through our prayers. So, Lord, God, I pray that we don't live in regret and shame for the past. Lord, but we accept your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness today. And we don't let another day go by missing an opportunity to be obedient to your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, that we leave this place and enter into a mission field to call the beloved into a relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. God, that we don't worry with the results, but we just know that if we're obedient to you, you will take care of the results. God, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and worship us.